very excited to introduce our next speaker, Chase Bartlett, who worked with me on this project again and again. I think we're already a minute or two late, so I'm just going to let him get started. And just like the last presentation, we'll have time afterwards for questions. So many of you have been my journey special through St. Ellen's, uh, whether it be in the classroom, on the tennis court, or in everyday life. So thank you so much. I'm excited to share a project that has taken up a better part of the last year. Um, my research culminated this summer when I traveled to Germany to try to understand why normal people welcome xenophobia and racism, especially in a place like Germany, which tried so hard to make up for its dark past. So I went to see if Nazis of the 21st century are really like the ones in movies. I went to a Nazi gift shop in the backwoods of Germany and asked far-right extremists about their beliefs. And then I went to the state parliament of Berlin to see how different those politicians were from the Nazis. Now, now when I first received an email from a German far-right extremist that named a great interview, I wasn't sure if I could follow through with it. Firstly, it meant renting a car uh, alone and driving about four and a half hours down the Autobahn. And secondly, his guest house would not have been my first choice to meet for an interview if I had an option. Uh, the German equivalent of a bed and breakfast was equipped with a bar, restaurant, gift shop, and was, for its location, quite a busy place. Hidden in the hills of rural Costa Vestra, the guest, shop, the guest house was the Disneyland for white nationalists, Premises and Nazis from all over the world. The guest house itself is home to the largest selection of Nazi merchandise and paraphernalia in Germany, and the village also hosts several thousand extremists per year for concerts. Now, when I walked inside the guest house, I met two guys about my age, and the first thing that I noticed was that all three of us were wearing the same pair of New Balance sneakers. That, along with the fact that they were drinking my favorite German beer, painted a very different picture of the Nazis that I used to previously imagine. When I used to think of Nazis, I thought of, as I'm sure most of you do, Adolf Hitler screaming in the packed auditorium, or Christoph Walton in Glorious Bastards. But I didn't think of these guys, just a few years older than me, who offered me food and coffee. But I wasn't here to interview this younger pair. I was there to interview Tommy Frank, one of Germany's most notorious neo-Nazis. This was his guest house, his business, and his gift shop. And when I met Tommy, he introduced me to a visiting American white nationalist named Keith, who also agreed to the interview. Here's a picture of them wearing cute Bastion t shirts. Uh, now, while Tommy and Keith have minor differences in beliefs, Keith told me that his worldview is the same as his extremist friends in Germany. He said it doesn't matter if you're in Italy, or in England, or America, we all recognize the 14 words. 14 words being, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. These 14 words, are which are from American terrorists or white nationalists, are what he calls the international slogan for his people. Now this ultimate goal, securing a future for white children, is driven by fear. Fear of a declining birth rate among whites. Fear of becoming a minority in their own land. Fear that migrants and minorities are gaining power and stealing their wealth fear that those same people are killing innocent citizens and raping white women. American white nationalists call this process white genocide. Less extreme nationalist parties call it a cultural takeover. Whatever you call it, these are the fears of 2019 that unite American white nationalists, German neo-Nazis, and moderate nationalist parties everywhere. Here are a few pictures from the guest house. Uh, this is a t-shirt that is being sold in the gift shop. It says, our time is coming. 14, of course, symbolizes the 14 words. 88, symbolizing how hit that. Uh, 8 being the 8 standing for H and the 8 letter of the alphabet. Now, here's another picture. You can see on the right the bar uh, in the corner area. And on the left, you can see some images of some other stuff that he sells, including books on weapons from the uh, Third Reich. And you can see mugs with the Deutsche Reich, uh, the Wehrmacht, Hitler's Africa Corps. And of course, at the very top, you can see a sound part of it, which is great. Now, this is the back area of the gift shop. It gives you an idea of 
just how much stuff this guy is selling. He's on his website. He's offering over a thousand products. Um, you can see the, the flags, which are from the, the German right. Um, and what surprised me the most about this was just how nicely Tommy and Keith were packaging their ideology, especially considering how extreme their beliefs were. Nowadays, white nationalists and Nazis advance their ideas in the name of tolerance, particularly toward people of other cultures. They both told me that they don't see themselves as superior to other people just because of their race. Instead, Tommy pointed across the room at a world map that was riddled with tiny red pens signifying where he traveled in the world. This served as evidence for him. He told me that he wasn't against Muslims. He visited Dubai and left the people there, he left the land. He had nothing to say against the Muslims in Dubai, because for him, it only matters if those foreigners permanently left their homes. Similar to most other neo-Nazis and white nationalists, Tommy and Keith believe that the world is naturally organized by ethnostates, the birthplace for each racial group. And that when a race deviates from that social order, social issues occur. The rape of white women, the cultural replacement, the high birth rates, these are signs of inevitable takeover, signals that represent not just a few immigrants, but all of them. So on the one hand, Tommy and Keith sounded somewhat tolerant, whether or not it's what they actually believe. They flat out told me, I don't see myself as better than someone else because of my race or my skin color. But on the other hand, were these ideas really that different from the Nazis of 1930? Tommy and Keith told me that a revolution, or end time, is coming. And that it doesn't matter even if you were born in Germany, when it comes to the Germans who are outsiders or foreigners, by blood or by skin, they're not looking for a world war, but if it means that five million children who are born here have to go back to where their ethnic originated, that's what's best for them. Any other solution will end badly for the world. Now, despite his extreme and even violent ideas, Tommy still tries to maintain a veneer of innocence and normalcy. He told me, I'm just a normal thinking man. What's even more interesting is how open Keith and Tommy were about the far right's attempt to rebrand itself. Especially in the United States, extreme right groups like the KKK or neo Nazi or skinhead groups have tried to moderate themselves under less threatening appearance. The American fascist movements, for example, are uniting under a title called the Alternative Right, or the Alt Right for short. Hiding the same ideas under an innocent name, these parties are trying to distance themselves from dirty words like fascist or Nazi. The same rebranding strategy is used elsewhere, especially among far-right parties in Germany, like the Alternative for Deutschland, or AFD, which even uses the same word, alternative, to describe itself. Now luckily, while I was in Germany, I also had the chance to meet with AFD. On June 6th, I went to the Berlin State Parliament to meet with Ronald Glaser, the AFD Berlin Party spokesperson, to see just how different the ideas were between Tommy, Keith, and a recently successful nationalist party. But a touch of background on the AFD first. It was started in 2013 as an anti-Euro party, meaning currency, and has since become more focused on removing immigrants and preserving German culture. For this reason, for this reason, many Germans see the AFD as fascist or connected to the Nazi movement. However, with the German government granting asylum to millions of migrants in 2015, anti-immigrant and anti-Islam sentiment has been steadily increasing point that in September of this year, the AFD received 27.5% of the votes in Saxony and 23.5% of the votes in Brandenburg. Moderately concerning side note is that when Hitler took power, he only needed 33% of the votes to do so. Here are a few of the advertisements from the AFD. The first says, Burkas, we wear bikinis. The second one may be a little more clear. New Germans, we'll make them ourselves. Now, when I talked to Glazer, he stuck to many of the same talking points as Tommy and Keith. He told me it might be their thing somewhere else to worship whatever gods they want. And we have freedom in Germany, too, but we cannot excuse everything which illegal immigrants do with their religion. We want them to be able to practice their religion, but we are not interested in making them stronger than they are. We don't want mosques everywhere. We need to be sending a majority of these refugees and Muslims home. According to him, they have to accept that they have their own rules and we have other rules here. Maybe above all for him, the greatest danger and 
here was in 50 years, the immigrants will overtake the white Germans because of the difference in birth rates. This rhetoric clearly echoing that of the neo-Nazis and white nationalists. So my last question to him was, how and why are nationalist parties like yours succeeding? In response, he said that it also had to do with rebranding and oversimplification. Well, the establishment of all these countries has moved so much away from the ordinary citizen. These parties like ours are down to earth, and they're speaking our language, speaking their language. Now, speaking their language, calling out fears, and designating a clear identity for white Germans. It was having a visible impact on the streets. My first day in my apartment in Berlin, an anti-Semitic protest, which neo-Nazis partook in, came marching by my front door. On the right, you can see a picture of anti-fascist protesters holding Israeli flags. And across the street, you can see anti-Zion posters uh, with the protesters. Later the same week, I had the unfortunate experience of watching a white German woman spit and kick a Turkish kid on the subway just because of his skin color. The point is that the rhetoric that is being shared by neo-Nazis, white nationalists, and far-right parties is making its way into everyday life. Now, while there are many takeaways that I gleaned from these experiences, I have two that I want to share with you today. The first is that if you're wondering why fascism keeps happening, here in the form of a white supremacist shoot every week, and there in the form of an increasingly popular nationalist party, it's because we don't teach why fascism happened to begin with. If you want to learn about fascism, you have to be uh, a college student interested in history or political rhetoric to even come across it. Now, to illustrate this point, when I got home, I visited two Holocaust memorials. The brand new one in Houston, and a much smaller one in San Antonio. I was surprised that neither museum offered any more than an explanation of what the Holocaust was, or what happened. In San Antonio, I took an hour to meet and speak with the people who managed the museum there. My biggest takeaway from that meeting was, that when I asked them why neither museum explained why the Holocaust happened, or what the ideology was that led to the violence and terror, they looked dumbfounded. There was literal silence in that meeting. So first, it has to become something that people know about. The KKK, the alt-right, the El Paso shooter, the New Zealand shooter, the neo-Nazis in Germany, these are all variants of the same belief system that we've got to start educating about. Now, the second reaction to growing fascism more ideological and political than the rest. In, today world, in today's world, it's easy to be a Nazi or a fascist or a white supremacist. It's easy to be a victim. It's easy to feel welcomed by a group that you're inherently a part of. It's easy to see one example of violence and think that that is representative for an entire group of people. It's easy to go online and have YouTube's algorithms feed you more and more extremist content. But it's hard to do your own research. It's hard to not play the victim. It's hard to understand complex reasons to difficult problems. You certainly won't find those answers on Facebook. It's hard to be empathetic enough to see a bit of your own humanity in everyone else. And maybe most of all, it's hard to challenge what you believe and imagine that there might be an alternative narrative, a different way of seeing things. Nazism is, in a way, a problem that affects normal people, appealing to the nature embedded in all of us. The feeling of being welcomed and having your own distinct identity feeling of partaking in something greater than yourself, or the feeling of having an easy explanation to your problems. So there is always a conflict in each of us between the right way and the easy way. As individuals in the global community, we have the difficult task of never taking the easy way, of considering the experience of others, and of constantly challenging and growing our beliefs. Thank you. Maybe they have some ideas about what it is. 
Uh, when you think of fascism, the main authors and reputable sources on fascism would describe it as um, being fear-based, right? So of course there's a big aspect of fear-based rhetoric that leads people to thinking that there's some kind of desperate um, attempt to, to retake things or reclaim what's been taken. You know, there's this fear that they've become a minority. Um, that's a very common thought among far-right extremists here, abroad, everywhere. Um, your question was why it happens or why we don't understand what happens? Um, my question was why it happens. Like when you were asking people at the museums, like why it happens, and then they were silent, like what would you have built the silence with? Well, definitely educating more about it. I think if you're a Holocaust museum, that's the place that I would expect to see this the most, right? Is you know, an explanation of what the ideology was that led to the violence. What was happening in, in 1900, um, in the way that they were thinking about anti-Semitism at that time, you know, how they were seeing themselves as a, a distinct group, uh, you know, the ways that they see ties to ancient Norse culture and that sort of stuff. That's the kind of thing that they should have definitely been educating in the Holocaust Museum that we should be talking about more in public space. So. Yeah. So when Tommy said that he Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> My guess is that this is more of a rebranding thing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this presentation is. They have certain underlying beliefs, and in Germany it's a little bit different because the freedom of speech laws are restricted there. So I don't think he's naturally allowed to say that he sees some races as better than others. Um, I know for sure that if you discriminate against a certain race or say things uh, of that sort of nature, that you're actually not allowed to, and it's illegal at that place. So um, my sense is that no, the ideas are really not that much different. They've just taken on a different packaging. They've just been wrapped with a bow on it.
why did genocide happen, what is fascism, these are things that scholars at Yale and Columbia are arguing about and that Chase has decided to tackle in one, um, in one research project. Um, it's really been 